Hi everyone, and welcome to this tutorial bite for Oxford Not Included, where we're talking about food. This will be a comprehensive guide to all of the food types in the game, how and when to make each one, and how to store food. I'll structure this by game phase, early, mid and late, but of course these are just rough timings. The basic reason for needing food is obviously to keep your dupes alive, and each dupe will need 1000 kilocalories of food per cycle. Unless you're playing on the highest difficulty, or have dupes with the bottom of stomach trait, in which case they need 1,500 kilocalories. In addition, food provides a morale bonus which can be quite significant, and this is the reason behind why you want to make better quality food. You can see here all of the food laid out by the quality rating, as well as the morale bonus for each tier. So looking at the early game food, all colonies start with nutrient bars in a ration box, which gives you the time to establish your colony. Which early food you can find and grow will depend on your start type. In all three scenarios, there is a non-spoiling food that can be found but not grown, and a basic plant type that can be grown and eaten. For temperate starts, as I'm showing here on the left, muckroot is found around the biome, but is buried. You can find these by looking for the buried object art on natural tiles. Mealwood is the basic food plant and requires dirt to grow, and you'll need five plants per dupe. In forest starts, as shown here in the middle, the non-spoiling food are hexalent plants, which give hexalent fruit when harvested. Mealwood is similarly the basic food plant for this start too. Finally, in swamp starts, which are unique to the spaced out DLC, swamp chards are the non-spoiling food and make swamp chard hearts. The basic food plant is the bog bucket. These require polluted water, typically from a pitcher pump, and you'll need 3.6 of these per dupe which is 18 plants per 5 tubes. They can also be fried on the electric grill to make swampy delights, which slightly increases the calories and quality. You'll need at least one dupe with a cooking skill to do this. For early food storage, the ration box will be perfectly fine for a while. Although food spoils fairly quickly in this, your production should be well balanced to your consumption, rather than making lots of excess to store. I will discuss how to size your food production in depth later on in the video. I do like to give my ration boxes, and fridges later, a higher priority to ensure food is stored in them and not left on the floor. I'll also mention here the mush bars, which can be made in the micro musher, and I consider these the emergency food type, since they can be made quickly from dirt and water. You should always try and grow food first and use these as a last resort, but don't hesitate to use them to save dupes from starving. They can be fried into mush fry, but generally I wouldn't bother with this, as they're only a last resort anyway. Moving on to the mid-game, once you've established your colony, explored the map, and have more dupes and infrastructure, you can expand the food types available. Ranching for food is possible, and in the early to mid-game, hatches are the easiest source to set up. I won't explain here in detail how to do this, but I will have a dedicated tutorial series on critters. Hatches will eat the minerals that are readily available and produce meat. The meat should be cooked on the electric grill to make barbecue, as this increases the calories and the food quality significantly. For plants, I'll cover here the ones that I commonly use and discuss the rest later on, including why I don't use them. Firstly, bristle blossoms are a good step on from the basic food plants and require water and light to grow. As you can capture water and steam geysers, this food is completely sustainable. The difficulty here can be temperatures, as geyser water tends to be hot, and these small ceiling lights make a surprising amount of heat. You can grow these early on, but a robust cooling system will be needed to grow these in the long term. I will cover cooling in its own tutorial bite. Bristleberry can be grilled into gristleberry, which increases the calories and food quality slightly. The other main plant that I use in the mid-game is sleet wheat, which I then grill into frost buns. Many map types have quite significant amounts of wild sleet wheat on the map. From my experience, a typical large terra map has enough for around 15 dupes. This is great as it requires no resources and can simply be harvested by dupes to make a decent quality food. That's why I leave my frozen biomes mostly undisturbed and only dig small access routes in to collect the grains. In the spaced out DLC, you may well be looking for food to use in rockets from the mid game. An easy way to do this early on is to use the pickled meal, which is made on the grill from meal lice, so is easy to obtain and long lasting. Later on in the game, the optimal food for space missions is berry sludge, as this is the only food you can make that will never spoil. Berry sludge requires sleet wheat grain and bristleberry, both of which I've just covered. 
When it comes to food storage in the mid-game, I use fridges in a sterile atmosphere, usually carbon dioxide. To quickly explain food spoiling, each food has a basic spoil time, which is typically 4 or 8 cycles. Combined with this, there are two factors that also affect how quickly food spoils, these being atmosphere and temperature. Food spoils more quickly in polluted oxygen, at a normal speed in oxygen, but this modifier can be reduced to zero in sterile atmospheres, such as carbon dioxide, chlorine or hydrogen. For temperatures, if the food is above 4 degrees Celsius, then it will spoil normally, but this is reduced by cooling it down below 4 degrees, which is easily done in a fridge. Cooling it further to below minus 18 degrees puts it in a deep frozen state, which will also reduce this modifier to zero. I'll touch on how to do this shortly. These modifiers add together, but the maths isn't really important. Just remember to keep food in a sterile atmosphere, use fridges to cool, and later on deep freeze with a cooling loop. I should also note here that prior to the patch in May 2021, the temperature was not considered, so unpowered fridges in sterile atmospheres were all that was required. Be aware that any guides or posts before this time will be out of date in the current patch. With that explanation, the reasons behind my typical mid-game storage setup should now be clear. I use fridges in a carbon dioxide pit which can be kept near the dining area. As carbon dioxide is the heaviest gas, it will happily sit in this pit and never be displaced once settled. For late game bases, this is where you can really be ambitious and start making the best foods. As you're only really limited by your imagination here, we really should aim to only make the highest quality food, and these are the four types you can choose from. Pepper bread, spicy tofu, mixed berry pie, and frost burgers. Note that frost burgers are slightly different from the other three, and are actually in a slightly higher category. The morale bonus is the same though, but eating frost burgers gives stoops a small stress decrease, but also decreases their athletics by one. Playing rationally, this generally isn't worth the trade-off, but I must admit I do like making burgers simply because I can. For all of these foods, you'll need to use the gas range building, which uses small amounts of natural gas. Pepper bread requires sleep wheat and pincher pepper nut. Spicy tofu needs nosh sprouts and pincher pepper nut. The mixed berry pie needs grub fruit, bristle blossoms and a supply of sucrose. And frost burgers require sleet wheat, lettuce and barbecue. As these ingredients are all plants, except for the barbecue and frost burgers and sucrose for mixed berry pie, you will need to have large scale farms to support this. In the late game, I would highly recommend wild farming, as this requires no resources at all, and you just need to control the temperature and atmosphere. Note that wild plants take four times longer to grow than domestic ones. I will explain how to do this fully in another tutorial bite, so all I say here is pick the plants you need for the food you want. Ranching in the late game can typically either be done with shovefuls or slicksters, both providing large amounts of meat for barbecue. Again, I have to be brief here, but shovefuls can be starvation ranched because as long as they are groomed, they will always produce an egg, even if unfed. Slicksters eat large amounts of carbon dioxide, but this can be produced from petroleum or sour gas boilers. There will be tutorial bites for these advanced builds, and in terms of numbers, a petroleum boiler can sustain around 80 slicksters, or 10 full ranches, and a sour gas boiler around 56 slicksters, or 7 full ranches. The final bit on storage takes the ideas that I've explained and adds cooling to make infinite storage. I'm going to show here two common methods, but there are many ways to implement this. Infinite food storage is done by having usually a small area with a sterile gas, either chlorine or carbon dioxide, which is then cooled to below minus 18 degrees. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume a working knowledge of cooling loops, but I still need to discuss coolants. Minus 18 degrees is an annoying temperature to make and you're limited to certain coolants. Obviously water won't work, so if you want to use liquids with an aqua tuner, you can use ethanol or petroleum, which can be made but are inefficient, or supercoolant, which is a late game space material. A thermoregulator can also be used with gases, as it's usually sufficient and can be run on hydrogen. This is the best gas to use, as it has the highest specific heat capacity, so it is the most efficient and will not turn into a liquid. Just run the coolant line behind the storage area with radiant pipes, and the food should stay fresh forever. In the two designs I have, the left side uses a little one tile high liquid lock, which lets dupes access the food dropped on the tile. Beware that the liquid lock needs to not freeze at this temperature, so oil or petroleum are good choices. 
Also, as you can see, the cold will leak out from this design as it's not fully insulated. I would advise running the base cooling loop near the other side of this to ensure it doesn't get too cold. The second design uses the corner access trick to keep a single tile nice and insulated. Note that in the current patch, only auto sweepers can access these corners and not dupes, although this was possible in previous patches. Therefore, you can use a fridge set to a small amount of food that the auto sweeper will keep full for the dupes to take. This means dupes always have access to food, but the majority of it is infinitely stored. For the next section of the video, and to comprehensively cover everything, I'm going to quickly run through all of the other food types I haven't yet mentioned. Firstly, dust caps can be grown and eaten raw as mushrooms, or fried on the grill, or mixed with lettuce to make mushroom wrap. I tend to avoid these as they require slime, which needs a puff ranch to make sustainably, and I don't usually make these. Also, the top tier of this food is not in the top food category. Lettuce is more of an ingredient than a food, but of course dupes can still eat it and you can find these plants wild on the map. Similar to the wild sleet wheat, you can simply harvest and eat this for free food. If using for frost burgers, then I would skip straight to wild farming. In the spaced out DLC, grub fruit comes in spindly or normal variants. The spindly grub fruit is strictly worse, and so if you do want to farm these, then aim for the normal grub fruit, which occurs when they're tended to by sweetles or grub grubs. These require a constant supply of sulphur, which can be satisfied by taming a sulphur geyser, but I generally find this more hassle than the other foods. You can grill the spindly grub fruit and grub fruit into roast grub nut fruit and grub fruit preserve, respectively. Grub fruit is needed for the mixed berry pie, which is one of the top tier foods. Paku fillet is gained when pakus die, and can be grilled into cooked fish, which I would highly recommend. This can then be combined with barbecue to make surf and turf, which is a great quality, but not the best. Therefore I don't aim to ranch paku for food, but I will take the free food that they generate. Omelettes simply aren't worth making. It's always better to hatch the critter and eat the meat, so I never make these. Tofu is made from nosh beans and water, and is a decent quality food. I generally consider this more work than it's worth because the nosh sprouts require a supply of ethanol. This is only really possible with fairly large scale arbitrary farms, usually wild planted, which I tend to avoid. Of course this features in spicy tofu, in the best tier of foods, and you can wild plant the nosh sprouts, but I think they're easier foods to make. Finally for this section, stuffed berry is made from pinch of nuts and gristle berry. It's only a great tier food, so I never bother with making this, as there are better options. Now the last topic to explain is sizing your food production, and for that I would highly recommend the Only Assistant Food Calculator, which is a third party website. To use this, simply choose the food you want to make here, and enter the number of dupes. You can then choose whether your dupes harvest the plants, or simply let the bounty drop, which will happen after 4 cycles from becoming harvestable. Note that during this time, the plants still consume resources for no output, so this should be avoided for domestic plants, but can be done for wild plants. There are then options for whether the plants are wild or domestic, and for fertiliser, which I generally don't use. The tool then outputs how much of each subfoods, ingredients, plants, and resources are required, and you can use this to size your farms appropriately. So that concludes this comprehensive guide to food and oxygen not included, and if you made it all the way through, I appreciate that very much. I hope this was useful, and thanks for watching.